Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 16th of the 11th month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it according to the scriptures and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it is the 27th of January, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our reading of the, the book of Genesis or Bereshit. We're currently on chapter 2. 31 here and again you you might be surprised with some of the differences in translation than what you might be normally familiar with this one is pretty interesting so i think we're going to look at it and then we're going to look at the hebrew for today so you can see what i'm talking about when we're getting into this there's one part that you won't find the hebrew directly in the strong's and I'll show you where that is and then where we can find it and why. But we'll get to that when we do. In the meantime, <clears throat> chapter 31. And just to recap, Jacob had been sent by his mother and father out of the land to go stay with her family to acquire a wife while his brother was angry at him for what had happened. And in the course of being out there, as we had already read last week, he acquired his wives, his children, and then possessions. And now we're going to see his uh, what causes him to go back. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he heard Eth, that Aleph Tau, the words of Laban's sons, saying, Has taken Jacob eth all that was our father's and from what belonged to our father he has made eth while well, aleph tau all this wealth or literally all the kavod or esteem or honor and yaakob would look at eth the face of laban and behold nothing of him with him as previously Three days before. This is the literal translation. They have it normally as, and his face was not towards him as before. Okay. The reason that this is literally the uh, ein is not or nothing, and ein nu is nothing of him. So that's essentially saying that nothing in his countenance was toward or with Yaakov as it was just three days before. And this three days previously is an interesting connection when you think about the parable that this represents. It's not normally translated this way, but Ab willing, when you look at this and you think about that, these things will be pretty evident. And Yahuwah said, to Yaakov, return to the land of your fathers and to the place of your children. And Ahiah with you. This is an I will or an I am with you. That Ahiah Asher Ahiah is where it says in Exodus, what is it, 14? Or um, possibly before then, but he says, I am that I am is his name. Furthermore, Yahuwah is his Shem Zakar, right? But he says, Ahiah with you. And that's what he says to Moshe right before he declares Ahiah Asher Ahiah. Again, we don't really see these things unless you look in the Hebrew, but this I will reveal, Aleph is I am or I will, He is to reveal or make evident like the light through a window. That's what that represents as a picture. It's the definite article, the. It points something out, or it's used in the form of a question. Like, is it, am I not my brother's keeper? Right, is, uh, I am my brother's keeper with a hey at the beginning. But I will reveal Yah. It also means I exist. Hey, yo, hey, yehi. When he says yehi or, this is the one that's yehi. 
And that very name is the one that was in the burning bush speaking with him. That is also used in the book of Gad the seer for our Mashiach, not the father, but the one dressed in linen with a golden band around his waist, just like you see in Revelation. The one who is as a man and not the one that you cannot view. He's the one that calls himself Ahia. And that's just like our Mashiach said when he was in the flesh before Abraham was, I am. And then they wanted to kill him for it. Back on track. So he says, return to the land of your fathers and to the place of your children and Ahia with you. And he sent Jacob and he called unto Rachel and unto Leah the field to his flocks and said to them. Now that doesn't read very right in English, okay? I'll, I'll go ahead and give this one to you because it is broken. And they try to make things make sense when you're reading so that you avoid confusion. But it doesn't say to the field here. It does say to the flock, and we'll get to that. But And he, our Mashiach, Ahia, sent Yaakob. And he, Yaakob, called unto the lamb and unto the weak and the world. Okay? The, the field is the world in the parables, if you recall. So he sends one, and the one who has what's returning at the heel of what he's doing calls unto the sheep and the weak and the world and calls them to his flock, if you will. Okay? And said to them, See, I, that word is Anoki, just like in the Ten Commandments where it says, Anoki Yahuwah Elohika, I am Yahuwah your Elohim. And that word is also literally my plumb line. Same spelling. Okay. See, I eth the face or the face of your father, that not of him to me, like nothing of him is to me as previously three days before. But Eloah of my father has been with me. Eth and you know that with all my soul, or with all my life, I'm sorry, I have served Eth, your father. Quite often, and I don't know if they do it in other translations, but in the Hallelujah Scriptures, they'll have the word for life, and it isn't actually the word for life. They actually do it in other versions too. The most prevalent one is um, where they say the life is in the blood. Almost every version of scripture in the English, it says the life is in the blood. But you look at that and it doesn't say the word chai or chayim. It's the word nefesh. The, that's the soul or the inner being of a man or animal. It's the nefesh that's in the blood that you're not supposed to consume. Makes a lot more sense that way. But this word is life. Either way, whenever you see that, you have to be careful and double check which one it's being talked about. It says, and you know that with all my life, I have served Eth your father. Yet your father has deceived me and changed Eth my hire ten times. But Elohim did not allow him, that literally did not give him to do evil against me. If thus he said, the speckled are your hire, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if thus he said, the streaked are your hire, then all the flocks bore streaked. So Elohim has taken away at the livestock of your father and given them to me. And remember, we mentioned that last week when we were showing the correct translation of what he was doing with those sticks had nothing to do with making them speckled, streaked, or anything. That was by the will and providence of our Creator alone. But He would put those sticks before the ones that would stay together, and then they would produce for Him, and then He would remove them 
and then they would produce for Laban when they would turn aside. And that had to do with the, the ones of the flock that would run off or would, you know, stay with the flock. A different picture there. But again, literally happened telling a parable. <clears throat> it says, so Elohim has taken away Eth, Aleph Tal, the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it came to be at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and looked in a dream and saw the rams the ascending ones above the flocks. That word above is El, right? And this word is Elim, right? Elim, Mem is a suffix, means them. But when you have a Yod Mem, it's a plural. So it's the aboveing ones above the flocks or the ascending ones above the flocks. When you have that Ayin Lamed Wanun, El, or Ayin Lamed Yod Wanun Elion Elion, that's Most High, for example. But we'll we'll see this one again as well. And it says, and when he he saw in a dream the rams, the ascending ones above the flocks, were streaked, speckled, and molted. And he spoke to me, Messenger the Elohim. It's literally Melech Ha Elohim in a dream, saying Yaakov. And I said, here I am. And he said, lift now your eyes and see all the rams, the ascending ones above the flocks, are streaked, speckled, and molted, or molted, you know, molted. For I have seen at all that Laban is doing to you. I am, or my plumb line, Anoki, I am the El of Bethel, where you anointed the standing column, and where you made a vow to me. At this time, rise up, get out of this land, and return to the land of the place of your children. It usually says the land of your relatives there. And I'll show you, it's literally the word for we say lad for a little boy, archaic word in English, right? But ladot or toladot is generations. Lada is to um, to conceive a child, to bring forth a, a, a offspring. So the mem at before that is the place of the means through which, and that's the land is the place of his children because it was given to his forefathers and to him and his children forever. But he was currently outside of it, just for the context here. And Rachel, or Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there again unto us any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Is it not as strangers we are reckoned by him? For he has sold us, and he ate also consumed at our silver. For all the wealth which Elohim has taken from our father is ours and our children's. At this time, all that has said Elohim to you, do it. Then he stood, Yaakov, and lifted or he carried Eth, his sons, and it, that word is Nasa, like Nasa, right? It's also the word that's part of the third commandment. You do not lift up, bear, or carry Eth, the Shem of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to not a lie, falsehood, fabrication, or ruin. But that's what that word is. They say he set, but that's not what literally is written there. It says, then he stood Yaakov and lifted, or carried Eth his sons and Eth his wives upon the camels. One of three types of reward, camels named that way because they also take vengeance. If you ever anger one, you get spit on and things like that. But that, that's the picture behind what they were. It is the type of reward that 
you get what's coming to you by you send out the goods and after a time you're going to get the the what you're reaping from it good bad or ugly and then it's culminated in if you put a yod before gimel it's yigmal i, I believe the pronunciation is something like that and it means to wean a child so the reward of every man in his life is in their children after they're weaned and you can see that as you do with his child who you are, so your children do with your children who they are. And you you reap what you sow in that kind of capacity by his almighty power. You can see this most clearly in Adam himself, in how he behaved towards the almighty, and then how Cain was. You can see it in how Aharon was, Aaron in what he did with the two tribes or the two houses while they were in the wilderness, representative of all 12, it happened to be typified and foretold to be in his two sons, counting as the two houses. But what happened with his children is just like what he did with the golden calf to our creator's children. So you get to see that pattern that happens with every man in his house. And that's that camel reward. So, and then the other ones we've already covered, Yaakob, is to get what you have at the heel of what you're doing. That is for the non-malicious sinner or for the one who is simple and does what's right. You get immediately at the heel of what you're doing your recompense. But here's the key. When the ravager stops ravaging, then he is ravaged, right? That's what he mentions. It's when you stop doing the offense, now you're going to pay for it. But if you're still actively doing it, you're just, you're hiking up the bill, if you will. <clears throat> and then Gamal, we just covered the other word for reward. And if anyone knows other ones, you can be, feel free to share. These are the ones that I'm familiar with, that I've studied. The last word for reward is shalom. The same word you have that we get peace from or shalom. And that is the reward that the Father will give to those that are His. The shalom of pleasantness. That shalom is from the foundation of the world leading all the way into the forever after. That's typified in the Shabbat or millennial reign that's coming. So back on track here. Sorry about that. It says, and he drove off, right? You drive cattle. Eth all his livestock and eth all his possessions, which he had acquired as part of his hire. His property of the livestock, which he had acquired at Padan Aram to go to his father Yitzach in the land of Canaan. And Laban had gone to shear Eth his sheep. Then Rachel or Rachel stole Eth the enfeeblers. It's the house idols is how they have it translated. And we'll get to it. You'll look at the Strongs and they'll show you that it. they don't know what that word comes from. But if you only look at the root with the Resh Pei He, it gives you to be weak and enfeebled. And that's what these things do. They enfeeble you. You become dumb, blind, deaf, and inept like the image or the, the statue that you're venerating. So it's literally the enfeeblers. And that's why they don't really want to translate that. But just like all the, the pagan mighty ones throughout scripture, you might not be aware, but Molech isn't really the name that he was called in history. Just like um, Apollyon isn't what he's known in antiquity. Um all of these words are close to with a letter or so different or the vowel pronunciation is different to make it a derision or a mockery of whatever particular kind for that particular idol. And that is 90% of the time or more. That's how you get all these names for, for pagan idols in scripture. He literally mocks them, but we miss it if we don't know that. The same thing with this household idol. The house idols, he mocks them. They're the enfeeblers, right? 
That's what he thinks of it. That's the truth behind them. <clears throat> But it says, um, and he stole away Jacob at the heart of Laban, the Aramean. So let me back up. It was, uh, and Laban had gone to shear the sheep, and Rachel, Rachel, stole at the enfeeblers of the house idols that were her father's. And he stole away Jacob at the heart of Laban, the Aramean because he did not inform him that he was about to flee. And he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over at the river, and set at, or Aleph Tau, his face, or his countenance, towards the mountains of Gilad, which means the heap, or the stones of witness, Right? And was told unto Laban in the third day that Jacob had fled. Then he took Eth his brothers with him and pursued him for seven days' journey. And he overtook Eth, excuse me, and he overtook Aleph Tal him in the mountains of Gilad. But in a dream by night, Elohim came to Laban the Aramean. And said to him, Guard yourself that you do not speak to Yaakov means of Tov nor evil. So you don't speak any good or evil to him, right? No blessings or no curse. No curse because he cannot curse one who is already Baruch. And no blessings because, um, well, it says in the book of Hebrews that it is beyond all doubt that the greater gives the Baraka to the lesser. So he was prevented from doing either. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched at his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brothers pitched in the mountains of Gilad, or Gilead. They have Galadad or Galadi, Gilead. There's different ways they have that pronounced or spelled. A lot of people are very peculiar about the vowels they use when they're speaking the Hebrew, and I'm not. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be. We should want to be truthful in all things and seek what is real. But the um, even within our lifetime, you can see that the pronunciation or the spellings of words in the Hebrew have changed. So um, there's a phenomenon just with the modern Hebrew, if you will, because any living language is going to change over time, adapts the meanings with the people as ages go on. We have that example with English in every living language, and th that's the reason why dead languages are called that. They don't change. The definitions are locked in place, and they're not adapting to the circumstances, if you will. But dead or living, it, it it's showing... Galad, Gilad, Giladad, Gilad. I've seen it spelled in a variety of different ways. So we got to be mindful of that when you're looking, especially if you want to look at older books or histories where people are writing about these things. Um, it's very easy to overlook things if you're not familiar. And again, you can look at the KJV and compare a modern translation to just see the difference in spellings of names and things. That 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 tell you the same thing too. But back on point, it says, And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have stolen at my heart and driven at my daughters off like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee secretly and steal Aleph Tal, or and steal from Aleph Tal me, and not inform me? And I would have sent you away with joy and songs, with tambourine and lyre. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters at this time. That's a different word. We have now, literally na, when you have that noon aleph. 
That is the word in English for now. And that's how I translate that everywhere we see it. But um, this one is ata, ayin tau he. And that usually means at the, in this instance, like at this time, literally is what it stands for. So I put that there just that we can see the difference in the use of what word is being used where. Okay. But it says, and you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. At this time, you have been foolish to do this. It is in my power, or it is in the power of my hand to do with you evil. But the Eloah of your father spoke to me last night, saying, guard yourself. That you do not speak to Yaakov, means of Tov, nor evil. And now you have gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal Aleph Tal, my Eloah? You see, he doesn't call it his enfeeblers. He calls it his Eloah. And Yaakov answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Least you tear eth your daughters away from me. Right, So he answered why he didn't mention that he was leaving. And now he states, With whomever you find, Aleph Tal, your Eloah, do not let him live. In the presence of your brother, in the presence of our brothers, see for yourself what is with me and take it with you. For Yaakov did not know that Rachel or Rachel had stolen them. Her, her name means sheep. Now, in a more practical application, I want you to see that Yaakov didn't know that, so he said their life is forfeit. And then she shortly dies after they come into the land when she has her child. All right? None of these things are without effect. We want to be careful about what we actually do and say. But it also is foretelling future events. And there's all, there's always a purpose in these. This is what Shaul was alluding to when he mentions that a woman would be delivered or saved in childbirth. Because there is no greater love than when you lay down your life for another. Right. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the tent of the two female servants, but he did not find them. <clears throat> and he came out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken Eth, the enfeeblers, and put them in the camel saddle, and sat on them. And Laban searched Eth all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my master that I am unable to rise before you, for the way of women is with me. And he did not search, or sorry, and he searched, but did not find Aleph Tal, the enfeeblers, or house idols. And Yaakov was wroth and contended with Laban. And Yaakov answered and said to Laban, What is my transgression? What is my sin? That you have hotly pursued me. Now that you have searched Eth all my property, what have you found of all your household property? Set it here before my brothers and your brothers, and let them decide between the two of us. And you remember what he said before they even started. It would be his righteousness that everything that was of his would only be streak spotted and all his property would be accounted for according to the terms that they set. Okay, and now he's saying, prove it. Show what I took that's yours, right? <clears throat> These 20 years I have been with you, your ewes or your sheep, and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your sheep. That which was torn by beasts I did not bring to you. I myself bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was, by day the heat consumed me, 
and the frost by night. And my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed at my hire ten times. Unless the Elohim of my father, the Elohim of Abraham, and the fear of Yitzhak had been with me, surely at this time you would now have sent me away empty-handed. Elohim has seen at my affliction, and at the labor of my hands, and rendered judgment last night. Now, it mentions the fear of Yitzhak. I didn't really get that at first, but the Elohim of Abraham and the fear of Yitzhak, meaning he was a 25-year-old man, a young man, when the command came to Abraham for him to take his son and offer him as an offering to the Almighty at the instigation of Satan, which we'll see in more detail in the book of Yobelim. But Josephus mentions that he willingly, of his own volition, as a man, was obedient to the Maker, fearing him even to the point of having his life taken. And he did that willfully. And that was accounted to him for righteousness. And because of that, like the promised seed, he was never, never kicked out of the land. When there was a famine, he produced a hundredfold in the land. All right, and he was never taken out. So there's pictures here, just to, to keep in mind, but that's why he mentions the fear of Yitzhak, because he feared his maker above everything else and was obedient to him, just as Yaakov was obedient to the visions from the Melech, the Elohim, that was appearing to him and telling him what to do. So it says, unless the Elohim of my father, the Elohim of Abraham, and the fear of Yitzhak had been with me, surely at this time you would now have sent me away empty-handed. The Elohim, or sorry, Elohim has seen Aleph Tau, or Eth, my affliction, and Eth, the labor of my hands, and has rendered judgment last night. Okay. And Laban answered and said to Yaakov, these daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock, and all that eth you see is mine. But what shall I do today to these, my daughters, or to their children whom they have borne? And now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and it shall be a witness between you and me. So Yaakov took a stone and set it up as a standing column. And Yaakov said to his brothers, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there on the heap. And Laban called it Yagar Shahadutha. But Yaakov called it Galaad. Right? And Yagar Shahadutha means the heap of witness in Aramaic or Aramean. Same thing as Galaad means the heap of witness in Hebrew. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. This is why it was named or its name was called Galaad, also mitzvah, because he said, Let Yahuwah watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight if you afflict eth my daughters or if you take other wives besides my daughters although no man is with us see elohim is witness between you and me and remember covenants carry on in the children this is why louis went and married a daughter of laban right and that's why most of the tribes would stay and marry within the family, to be within covenant and keeping this as true of marrying only within Laban's daughters or the ones given to Yaakov. And Laban said to Yaakov, See this heap and see this standing column, 
which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this standing column is a witness. There's two of them. That I do not pass beyond this eth heap to you, and Aleph Tau you do not pass beyond this Aleph Tau heap and this Aleph Tau standing column to me for evil. The Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Nehor, and the Elohim of their father rightly rule between us. So, and this will give you the nuances if you pay attention when you're reading the accounts like with the battles of Dawid or the times of Judges when the Arameans would ally with the foreign peoples and attack those in the land, they would always get routed. And whenever the children would go over and do anything antagonistic against them in hostility, they could not prevail because of the covenant they've made that's still applicable. You can never undo these things. That's the thing with getting married as well. A covenant can't be voided. Once it's established. <clears throat> it says, And Yaakov swore by the father of his father Yitzhak, and Yaakov slaughtered a slaughtering on the mountain, and called his brothers to eat bread. And they ate bread and spent the night on the mountain. And Laban rose up early in the morning, and kissed his sons and his daughters, and he barak, or blessed, Aleph Tau them, and Laban left and returned to his place. All right, and then just one moment, we're going to switch over, and I'll show you what it says in the Hebrew here. All right, so here is the interlinear for chapter 31. This is from BibleHub.com. I prefer this version. There's many other versions. You don't have to use this one, but it if you use an online one, there's some benefits and then there's some downsides, right? The benefit is you have all these hyperlinks and you have all the accessibility right at the click of a button. So, for example, on this version, you can pick any word you want. You can look at the transliteration, right? And this generally will give you how to pronounce if you know how to read the scholarly linguistics there, right? With the chevrons and the dashes or... If you're familiar with the vowel points, it's the same, right? Supposed to be the same, although you'll find uh, examples where they do not have it correct here as it's supposed to be pronounced there for whatever reason. I'm, I'm still learning, so I don't know why they do that, though. But back on point, you can find any word here and click on the Strong's number, and it'll take you to that that particular Strong's number, right? That that word where you get the pronunciation, you'll get what it generally means, how to say it, right? And then where it's used throughout Scripture. What it doesn't do is give you every meaning of it. So if you really, excuse me, if you really want to know what a meaning or a word means, you have to check all the Strong's numbers with that particular spelling. And you'd go over, like, here's the same word, Lamed Bet Nun, but it means white. Okay. This one, to make brick. Libena. All right. And that's Leben, to make brick, they say, because you have Lamed is to, for, concerning, in regard to, right? And then Bet Noon, like a sun, or Bina, Boon is a bone, but it's a structure, or to build. So Leben is to make brick, or it's unto building, and you would build with brick. right, to be white. So you, you see my point that you have to click through, you check all of them, and you do that for every word, or you can use the etymological dictionary when you flip to that, when you just look at every entry for that spelling. And then 
if you really listen to what Eric Bissell says, you can, when you're trying to see what a word means, you can look at the definitions for it when it has other letters. If you put a hay in front of it or at the end, if you put a maim at the front of it, if you put a yod, if you add different suffixes or prefixes or even a, a letter in it, like if you have gimel lamed is to roll, it's a stone, right, to return. Gimel yod lamed is like a revolving door or it literally means to roll around. So it, it gives you a sense of or a similar meaning with the different letters there. And when you check out the dictionary, the red dictionary, as it's affectionately called by Eric Bissell, or the etymological dictionary of the Hebrew language for readers of English by Ernest Klein, if you want the full title. But you don't have to use that one. Any one of them will do. You just look at all the definitions. Look at the related spellings. And then you can get a full sense of what this really means. It takes time. You don't have to do it all at once and know everything. But a little bit at a time, I would read a proverb every morning. And then I'd pick a sentence a day and break it down. You know, Anyone could do that when they have an opportunity. But right here, and this is where you can see the literal the way the Hebrew goes from right to left. But the English is from left to right so you're going to see it's left to right left to right left to right underneath it however we're going this way i'm sorry if that's confusing it's why i don't read from this normally and we we just put it in english translated correctly if we can but it says and he heard or shema's hear believe and do right and he shemad aleph tau the words of the sons of Laban, right? Just so you can see that that's how it flows with the literal, literal translation there. But we're not going to get too far into that. I do want to show you, we've already read through it, so I want to get to the highlights. Right here, I mentioned Yaakov, right? And then you can see it's from the word origin is Ayan Kufbet. You click on that one, and it says heel, footprint, or hind part. Then you, you look over, same spelling, different pronunciation, ikeb, is consequence, or as a consequence of, or because. So meaning what happens because of, right? Literally coming at the hill of what you're doing. And that's what I mean when you go into these, right? To follow at the hill. A sale insidiously circumvent and overreach. All right. And then we can see if there's anything the other direction, real quick. There's an overreacher and insidious, deceitful, or tracked by footprints. You can say Sir Planter is another one they put, right? And you get both of those senses from this. And then you have one that means steep or hilly, which I've never seen before. They call it rough ground. Very interesting. And it looks like it's only translated that way one time, meaning it's something they call a hapax legonemnon, or it's only a one. It's the only time it's spelled that way anywhere in what they call the Bible. It, you can see right here, sometimes they'll have the actual verses and this one they don't. They just give you how many occurrences they have and you'd have to click on this hyperlink to go to that occurrence to see it for yourself. But you see, they have it one time, one, one, one. Here's two, at most three here with a pluralization of it. And then, ak, kub, six. But either way, this is what you have to do when you really want to break down and get a sense of a word. You don't take and just pick and choose what particular meaning you want it to mean. You, you take it all in, you read it, and then you just accept that's what it means. You don't have to do anything else. It doesn't have to make sense beyond this is what the word means. And then as you use it in the language, the context will dictate what you're 
what it's saying. That's literally how the Hebrew works in everything. We have examples of that even in English today where you have words that have dual meanings. Sometimes they're even polar opposites of one another. For example, baraka or barak is to bend the knee. It means to bless, but it is also literally to curse. And the context tells you which one it is. In that same way in English, you have words like to cleave means to split apart or divide or to cling to. And the context gives you the meaning. So these phenomena are, are familiar to us. It's just, it seems different because it's a different character that we're looking at here. So back on track, you can see the where the Aleph Tau is used. These are placeholders for all the things he's defining as his. He's the responsible party. He's the one that did that. And you might wonder, well, Aleph Tau is the one that put the words in the mouth of the sons of Laban to turn to, to say these things in his presence. Was it not Yahuwah who turned the heart of Pharaoh and the Mitzrayites to conspire against him? It says it right there. And the whole purpose was to show his wonders, to make his name known, and to deliver his children out of the land while correcting them for their things that they were doing wrong and recompensing every man according to his ways and deeds. So the Aleph Tal, he's claiming all, right, the possessions. Everything that Yaakov left with was nothing, and everything he came back with was the, the property that he gave a tithe from, literally what he himself had provided for him to give. And that's another principle when I said you can't outgive your maker. He only gave a tenth of all the bounty that he had received to begin with. Just something to keep in mind. Um, here's that part where it mentions, and it was not favorable, right? Wairah, and he saw Yaakov. Aleph Tal Penei, right? The Aleph Tal, the face over the countenance of Laban, and behold, Wahina, right? Not of him, Inunu, right? This is Ayin, which means not, nothing. Ayin o Zolti is mean there is no other, where he says there's not, there's no other power or authority, right? Is that Ayin? It literally means not, right? Where we get the word ain't in, right? Ain't nothing. Ain't got it, right? Not, nothing. They have it translated in a variety of ways here, but it literally means the absence of a thing, okay? And he's saying there is not of him that, of him with him. They say toward, but the uh, emu is literally with. When you have Emmanuel, for example, as a title slash name of our Mashiach from Yeshiyahu chapter 53, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, that is literally L with us. That's that with right there. And you can see literally it means to be with, among, present with right so and he had not of him with him the literal translation and then this one is ka this is kit or ki tamul right ki tamul which is as before or as previously they just have it translated as, but that cough by itself is as. And tumul as a word means yesterday, recently, formerly, or as we said, previously. And then you have the shli shum or shli shawum, which is literally the three of them or literally three thems, which is the three days before, is how that's three days ago, 
is literally what it is meaning, but they say day before or yesterday, or in a sense, figuratively, it means previously, right? But it literally means three days before, which is the significant thing only if you're paying attention to what this is trying to foretell for the future, our past and future, right? It, and just for anyone, you just look up the three days, what it says in any Bible app, you search, put three days, and then read the narratives. There's a whole theme about the third day. This is what that's talking about. While Yamarni said, Yahuwah el Yaakov, or unto he who has it coming at his heel, right? Shub el Eretz, return to the land of your fathers. And unto the place of Ladat Ka, the Lad. Dot, that's the children, your children, or your offspring, the, the place of your offspring. And here's one of those words where I was telling you, you can have a, you can have a subject and you know, a whole bunch of stuff here. Just in this one word, you have one, two, three, four. You have and, unto, that's the place or the means of your children. And that one is you or yours, literally the ka. So you actually have one, two, three, four, five words you can get just from this one in English. Sometimes they do that. This is this is a plural, multiple words. This one's multiple. And just something to keep in mind. That's why uh, you can't be dogmatic about things when you want to do a literal English translation. Some, it's just not possible sometimes. But right here, this is his wa we ehe or we ye, right? They say wa ahaya, that's that aleph. I will reveal ya, which is literally I am or I will exist. to fall out, to come to pass, become, or be. That's the yaw. It means to, to exist, to come to be. And that's the same thing as his name. When you have Yahuwah, it's a yod, hey, wa, hey. That, let me find that real quick. Right here, it's he, he who, he is, or he will, and then that hey wa hey is cause it to be, or to fall about. So he who causes it to be is the Almighty, or is Elohim. And that's his name through which we're delivered by. That's his remembrance to all generations. He who causes it to be. But right here, you have the identification of our Mashiach. And I, I really like to get into that with us some other time. Can't do it right right now. But I'll show you. I'll show you when we can put it together. This is literally right here. You can see it in number. Was it numbers? I'm thinking of Hakol. I'm sorry. You can see it in Exodus when he says, I will or I will be with you, or I am with you, to Moshe. And he says, Ahia, Esher, Ahia, I am that which I am. That's that's our Mashiach identifying himself there as well. Every time you see this as an I, that's him. It's never used anywhere else, as far as I'm aware, for someone identifying themselves as an I. You see what the word means. It means to exist or be. But Ahia, they translate as, I am with you, and I am with you. You could say, right? That very Ahia is mentioned as the man in linen with the golden band in the vision from Gad the seer. Absolutely identifying that one as the one the father calls his son to whom nothing in creation is comparable. And he also explains why these things had to happen to him. And the fact that, that he was steadfast while enduring it is that he will be exalted as it was shown to him and as actually happened, where he is now at the right hand of the Almighty. Um, 
we got a little bit more time here. I wanted to cover the, the parts in here that seem to be translated interesting. Like again, here you have as previously three days before, right? And then they usually say, and Elohim of your father, right? But right here, you have Aleph, Lamed, and then that dot, this little dot is a holum. They use that and they remove a wall. When you look at a lot of the words, and this is what they call the defective and full spellings whenever you look at the the Masoretic text and the vowel points they use, if you look into it, you're going to find that they supply the vowels for quite a few words, but not all of them. And they had a consistent theme that anywhere where there was a redundant vowel, like you had two was in a word, they would drop one and replace it with a vowel. They did that with Elohim, and they did it even when there wasn't one, like the, the word Moshe, Noach, Zebulun, Elohim, Yahushua, literally over Kol right here. This word is Kaf Wa Lamed. They would drop the Wa and put a vowel point to approximate the sound, but the letter should be there. You only find that when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. When you look at the way the writings were before the invention of the vowel points, you find that they actually had these consonants used as vowels. They, the system is known by scholars as the mater lectonis, or the mother of tongues. And it goes through what consonants in Hebrew represents vowels. But I'll make it, it's very simple. The vowels in English are A, E, I, O, what do we got? O, and U, which is that wa, sometimes Y, but it's the same vowels that we have here in English. The, the exact same phonetics, the sounds, are Hebrew vowels. We've never had them different. They've changed how they've been used over time, but it's still the same phonetics, phonics, if you will in our mouth. Excuse me. Either way, I'm trying to show you right here, Aleph, Lamed, Wa, He is literally Eloa. The Yod at the end means of in this instance because you have the two dots below, which is a Sere for the vowels. And whenever you have a Sere followed by a Yod at the end of a word, that always denotes the whatever of. Now you see there's a yod here, but there is not the sere, so that means my. That's why it says my father, but this is the Eloah of my father. Just for just for some sense there. Here's another thing that we had different. Oh, it was not with him as before. Sorry. And then it says, and you, right? Wa eth nu. You know, in all that I may serve your father. This is where they had my might, sorry. But you can see that it was translated as, um, oh, what happened there? It glitched on me. Anyways, it had might, but that was that word for... Life with or resembling remember cough can be with as like or resemble and then chai is life so i translated that and he says and you know that i have served him with all my life it says might in the english but when you think about what this parable represents who yaakob was a foreshadow or tip defying here and that he served his higher cost his life, then these things make more sense. So I willing we'll leave it there. But moving on right here, they how they translate my wages consistently into um 
my wages is actually a higher. That's where you get the word Yishikar. Yishikar, one of the sons, is the higher of the wages with the mandrakes, if you remember, right? And then um, there was one more here I wanted to show you at least before we go. Well, there is really a whole bunch. There's there's the uh, struck. The, you can look at all of these things and break them down, but we just don't have the time for that. So I want to show you two more things at least where it mentions the ascending rams, right? Right here. So he says, and he beheld in his eyes and saw in a dream, right? Wahina, and behold, the rams. Right, the it says which leaped, but that's ha the olim, like well, it's not not like olam, but like l that ayin lamed to be upon above and then pluralized. So it's the ascending ones. And you can just look at the strongs there. It means to go up, to ascend, or to climb. It, it does not mean leap. They do that by an implication. So this is the thing that you got to be mindful of. It's Things are translated in English like that all the time, and then you can miss what it's actually saying. So um, anyways, it says... And the rams, the ascending ones above or upon, and this word right here, I'll show you it real quick. It means to be up, upon, or above, but it literally is also the word for a height. And it literally is oh, the other way. It means to be a yoke. It's upon, over, or above, like Elion is the most high, but right here, same word, but you have ol, it's like an o, which this is actually where we get our o from. In the paleo, it's an eyeball. It's literally the o where we get that character. But this one means a yoke. And that's when, um, when he says, take my yoke upon me and learn from me. We are both yoked to my our Mashiach and he is above us. And it's by his authority that we're yoked to him that he is training us. That's what this picture, that's what this word represents. So when you have something that says above or upon, it's not always just higher than. It's also connected with and has an authority over in some capacity. You can see this all the way back in the beginning when you had the bodies of things created the Shamayim, right? The not the firmament, but the Shamayim of Shamayim, the earth and the waters, because of those mundane bodies, it caused the light from the Father to be dimmed, and the darkness was yoked to above, but also upon the abyss. It was not everywhere. And it was because of the things created blocking the light that was already in existence. So that's a thing for another time. Um, but right here, there's one more we wanted to get to. The part where he's talking about the anointed. This is our Mashiach uh, right here, Anoki. We had done that one. And that means I. It, it doesn't give you a derivative from it, but you go right here. Anok is to plummet or a plumb line. It's to get true perpendicular particularity, to get true verticality, to get the actual up and upright. So that's the idea of that I there. This is his standard for uprightness or plummet. True verticality. And that's right there at the beginning of the Ten Commandments and a few places right here, as you can see. All right, that to anoint. We've, we had that one. That word for anoint is also a word for destroy. Something interesting. And then we've gone over Mashiach before, but we'll do that again. Kum is to stand. Now or at this time is the Atah, right? We've talked about that. 
And then uh, this one with the family, we've gone over literally of the children. Ah, it's this one right here. This is the strangers. Okay. Literally, noon karat, karatu, or karitu. But that is to be in strange or foreign or alien from nekar, is misfortune or calamity. Right? To act or treat as a foreigner, stranger, disguise. All right? To regard or recognize. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry about that. And then... Um, that's not the right word. I want to see if there's anything over this way. Nikar, yeah, to which is foreign or foreignness. So you see, it means to be alien or foreign. This noon, cough, resh, yod. Now the key here, the interesting thing, is if you remove that noon, because a noon at the beginning of a word or at the end of the word is like a lightning bolt or like, turning a key in an ignition uh literally the noon noon wa noon is a fish like the living thing nin or ninis like the word nineveh means child offspring or the the one that lives afterwards so the idea of a noon is a, a living or moving thing literally like a lightning bolt and it's the action or the imparting of a thing like the ah the doing of it right if you take that away and you look at the cough Resh Yod, the Karat or the Karati, that is a like a covenant. It has to do with a Brit or something that's written down or broken or cut off. And then it's the name of the uh the Karati and the Pelati are the, the Karathites and the Palatites are the guards of the beloved, the Philistines that joined and became the bodyguards of Dawid during his reign and it's also the word for cretan it's that uh the hebrew word for a cretan where you have shawul mentioned in a greek for it but he says those cretans are certain ways and certain kind of individual that is what that word represents and that is what it, they're saying here that we are like that to him at this time and just just so everyone can see real quick. If you look at the word Cretan, right? It used to be right there, plain, but you have to actually dig in. It was right out in the open. They hide it now. You can see it means deformed, dwarfed, or deformed idiot. And it is literally in the Latin, the vulgar Latin, Christianos, or a Christian, is that Cretan or Crestin, which is the deformed idiot. They they mock, you, you remember, they do these things just like they use the words that they do as a type of occult, you know, thing. They're hidden meanings, but they do it to mock real believers with what they say and this word calling them christians was mandated by sixtus the third instituted as part of the roman canon code what became municipal law throughout the world but the um the code the statutes that they were going to be demanding to call catholic christians and that was enforced by the sword of rome and that's what they say it means. But in scripture, that word is Cretan. And it's actually that kaf, resh, yod. And then you can read about what Shaul says with a little more context. And you can see the ones he's laboring for and what they look like that are considered as strangers to the one they're leaving. Ob willing, that will make more sense. And... Um, it will pique the interest of everyone to get into looking at the Hebrew more for yourself because 
This is not exclusive to me. I literally made nothing up. Everything is right there, book definitions. All you got to do is take the time to look. But um, one more one more treat, and then we'll go. This hazil, I believe this word for zeal, he has taken, right, is also that word is to strip, plunder, deliver oneself. Yeah, it's literally to snatch away or to like expel, to fling from yourself. And that's what he did um, to the children when he delivered them out of Egypt. He ah, flung them out and exported them. So there's a little picture and connection right there too. But uh, I think that should be what we have to cover for today. And you all have a wonderful Shabbat, uh, Shavuot Tov, great week ahead, and we will see you next time. Thank you.